Welcome to Right Talk with Mike Lee, where we believe that right talk is talk that is true, that is educational, enlightening, and inspiring. My guest this evening, I have two guests who I'm really honored and grateful that they're here, really. Guest to my immediate right is Susan Arvai. She is a candidate for the 21st, 21st district. Congressional yeah. District. You're, you're a candidate, you're a public. You candidate against you aspire to be a candidate against Do Lloyd Dog, is that right? I, I had, yes, I did. So you've been holding office since since too since long. <laughs> way too long. <laughs> since since the, since they parted the Red Sea. <laughs> and my other guest is Reverend Steve Miller. I just met Steve and I believe in being honest with you. I had planned to do a show today with Steve, but when Susan told me she was <laughs> available, I figured I roll with I roll with the good with the big man given. Hey, and the, hey. Big, and the big man's up there. Yeah. I understand. So I'm I want to thank, I wanna thank you guys for being on the show. You're welcome. Oh, Naomi, this I mean Susan. Susan, Susan this is Steve. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. And I, I I want to get to get to know both of you mm -hmm. because I just met Steve and I've known Susan for some time, but I have really yes. I've met her and I worked on a couple things with her. Yes. Now, Susan, my first question to you would be. Why are you running for office? Well, I'm running for office because I feel called to serve my country in this capacity. Um, as a former mayor, uh, I understand how important it is to serve the people and the purpose of government, and I think I can take that to Washington and set an example in some cases as to what I believe the federal government should be doing. So you want to go to the swamp? <laughs> I will go wherever I need to go to do what's in my heart to do, which is to help the country uh, get back on track, to bring our values to Washington, and to be that citizen servant that goes for a time to bring their expertise to help our country. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to the swamp, I'll go to Washington, and wherever else God sends me. You said that you were mayor of uh, San Marcos? Yes, sir. For how long? I was mayor for three terms, uh, and I left office in November of 2010. Mm, it's a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, my wife has been living in this area for, I think, 15, 16 years, and she was talking about the tremendous change that's taken place in San Marcos. Mm -hmm. Is it, so you were involved in all of that? I was uh, blessed to be involved for a period of eight and a half years on the dais total. And uh, San Marcos grew tremendously. We did some amazing projects, and I think really laid the groundwork for what you have seen in the past several years of the growth. You know, San Marcos has been named one of the fastest growing cities in the country uh, because of some of the things I believe the, the council and I put together. Was that, was that, did Amazon come to San Marcos in that time period? No, no, Amazon was new, but we had Griffles came into San Marcos. Mm -hmm. There were, um, we did a lot of infrastructure projects that paved the way for the Amazons to come in town. We, we, you know, at one point we only had one overpass around the trains. Um, people couldn't always get to the hospital mm -hmm. um, quickly. So mm -hmm. during my tenure, we built two more overpasses, which um, took, you know, the first one took 15 years, and then we got another one done uh, two years, within that two years of that. You know, I had planned mm -hmm. to do, uh, be, I'm honest with you guys, mm -hmm. uh, I believe in being honest and being straight. Yes. I had planned to do a show with Steve, because I met Steve, we met last week in uh, Mimadri. Mm -hmm. I had one taco, <laughs> and we met through Richard Franklin. Now, I yes. have to give credit for Richard, for Richard Franklin in part for this show. Because I've met a lot of good people through Richard Franklin, mm -hmm. even though he did say, tell me that he was glad I was here because people had somebody else to hate. Oh. 
That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I enjoy his, his Wednesday meetings. I call it Richard's Roundtable. Mm. Uh, he doesn't know that. He made it. I, I wouldn't care if he did. <laughs> but that's what I call it because we, some guys get together with different mm -hmm. points of view, different ideas, yes, yes. and we just exchange thoughts and ideas and, and talk to each other that's right. in a very civil manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody, I, although I'm a conservative and well known for being a Republican around here, mm -hmm. I haven't got any fights yet. Richard hadn't hit me yet. <laughs> 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 and, you know, it, it, it's all because with us, it's all about what's right and what's good for the community. It's mm -hmm. not about us right. or what mm -hmm. we feel or what we think. It's about getting something done positive in the community. Now, Steve, uh, you talked about a project that you're working on. Uh, is it some, some kind of reconciliation project? Yes, actually, I'm working on HBCU Truth and Reconciliation Oral History Project. And what this project is about, it's about healing. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to tell a story of a time that you were racially discriminated against so you can release that story and then allow God to come in and heal that broken place. Mm -hmm. You know, in this country I found that there's not very much empathy between people. And many times when African Americans and Hispanics go to tell of an instance or a time when they were racially discriminated against, many times that story is denied or discounted. Mm -hmm. And so when you discount that story, you end up in effect keeping that story, keeping it on you. And it leads to stress, it leads to hopelessness, it leads to um, depression, and many other things. So we have decided that we do this project so people can release those stories, begin to heal, and then put out the narrative of exactly what racial discrimination is and how it affects people, not in a way to blame or to point finger, fingers, but to raise their level of compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, When my wife comes to me and, say, and she says, Steve, you hurt my feelings. First thing, the first natural thing for you to do is to say, no, why do you do that? Because you don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings. Mm -hmm. And you say no because you can't believe that you've done that. But the only way for anyone to solve a problem is to get past that no and to start talking about it so you can know what the problems are and then form a solution for it. Mm -hmm. And that's where this country needs to be, and that's where we're not right now because everybody is so, you know, um, hardened in their stances and in their own experiences. And you know, mom and daddy has never told you anything wrong, you know, so that's where those experiences for, are from. And so it's hard to hear somebody else's experience, especially if that experience has hurt them and possibly could hurt you. Mm -hmm. now, now, Susan. Yes, sir. This, you ran for, I guess, for, for Congress once before, didn't you? Yes. This is, how many times have you <laughs> attempted? <laughs> I attempted, this will be my fourth attempt to get to Washington, time? yes, to serve my community. That's the, there's power in perseverance, you True. know. True. When you feel called to do something and it's deep enough in you, you just don't go away. It just doesn't go away. You just need to keep on fighting for what you believe you're supposed to be doing, no matter what the odds look like. That's, to me, a deep call. What, what is, what is, the, what is, what makes up your district? Which counties? Um, there's in this race, there's 10 counties, and it stretches from North San Antonio all the way to Travis County, out to Kerrville and Fredericksburg, and into Lakey. Um, so, uh, you know, all along I-35, you know, so you all have, up and down I-35. Do you have offices in, in all these places, or outlets or something? Um, we are just, we have mobile offices. We mm -hmm. are up and down uh, mm -hmm. I-35 because that's you know, west of I-35 is where it starts, pretty much. Um, so we spend a lot of time on the road uh, going into the communities and getting to know the, the people and what's on their hearts and minds uh, and what they would like to see in uh, this particular race because this is a, a, a new opportunity for District 21. Um, as Lamar Smith has uh, served long and well, and he made the decision to retire. So it's an open seat. It's an open seat? It's an open seat. Steve, you're working on a, on a multi-county mm -hmm. project, so to speak, also, aren't you? The Oral History Project? Yeah, the Oral History Project. It's a, it's a national project. It's a national project? Yes, sir, it's a national project. Now, there's something that you mentioned when we were at Mimadri the other day about uh -huh. a project you did in Bastrop, I think it was? Yes, sir. What was that? What was that? Well, what happened was... I'm talking about the one where you, you met with the bunch of ministers and you asked them how they felt and some, some other things came out after right, that? Right, right, right. Well, actually, that was in Carthage, Texas. 
-hmm. That was in Carthage, Texas. Um, I'm working with a group of conservative Republican ministers there on how to do racial reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so I have a real specific way of doing that. And my way is through love, compassion, and empathy. So in order to build that, you know, I asked a question that very many people aren't asked on a daily basis. And because it's not asked on a daily basis, people don't know how to answer it. Mm -hmm. And um, I simply asked them a question leading into the topic of racial reconciliation. I just asked them how they felt. And their response was? Complete silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Complete silence for a period of two or three minutes because they've never had a person ask them how they felt. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're, in a, when you're in a minister, you know, uh, you're used to talking with people. You're used to being in control. You're used to being in command. You're used to helping people. Mm -hmm. You're not used to people coming to you asking you how you felt because you're used to being in charge. So when I asked them that, it threw them off. But they were glad to tell me. <laughs> but at first, it was hard for them to answer. So, but so finally, they did. So Susan, you're not yeah. running against another dog. You run for an open seat. It's an open seat? Yes, because it's being vacated by Lamar Smith. Well, who, are you going to have some primary challengers? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, 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 well, what I'll just tell you is I was um, in line, uh, and I was the second to file. <laughs> On the first day of filing and 30 days later, there's 18 of us in this primary race. 18. Wow. <laughs> you know, that's positive in many ways that we have people that, for whatever reason, felt to step up. I think, you know, it, it is an attractive opportunity because there is not an incumbent mm -hmm. in the position. Um, Who's the Democratic challenger? Uh, that they have four in their primary, so we don't know, and we'll know on March 6th. Is Lloyd Doggett one of them? No, no, he's no. in District oh, this 35. Oh, yeah. 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 oh, okay, this is a completely open seat. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. You got a good shot at it. I do. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the uh, largest uh, municipality of in that, in that? The, San, uh, the portion of Bear County, San Antonio and Bear County, is the largest voting population. So that's going to make it tough. Well, no, I, we, we think that it's such a great district because it's the next largest is the Comal County where mm -hmm. I live, Hayes County where I was mayor. Um, and then, you know, I, I went to Gardner State Park in, in the areas of uh, Lakey, you know, so into Kerrville mm -hmm. and Fredericksburg. So it's a very diverse um, group of voters. And we think there's, it, it's not really going to just be San Antonio. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is Kerrville very big? I went there once. Kerrville, it's beautiful. I went, there, I went there once to see the eagles in the spring. And it's growing, you know, It's oh. and it is growing, but it's a big part. I mean, that whole area is in this district, Kerrville, Fredericksburg. It's, it's a big district. It's 800,000 people, and sometimes it takes three hours uh, drive to get to a particular meeting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Steve. Yes, sir. Um, this project that uh, that you're working on at, in Bastrop was it? Is it still is it still ongoing? It is. I know it you. Is. I know you mentioned that when we were at the at the restaurant that you had were working with like something like 200 ministers. Or something. Well, well, no, no. My project is a national project, mm -hmm. but the ministers that I'm working with right now are in East Texas, Northeast Texas, mm -hmm. and that's Carthage. But I started my work in Bastrop. That's where I cut my teeth at. Okay. Yes, sir. But my current project, it's national, but the group of ministers that I'm working with are in Northeast Texas. Those conservative ministers? Yes, sir. Like the conservative mm -hmm. ministers, okay. yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. How is that? You enjoying that? I am. I am. Is it challenging? No, not really. Is it fun? It is. Mm -hmm. It is. I'm called to it. Um, when you're called to something, you know, you have a directive from God. And also when you're called to something, this is the way God programs you. So this is the only program that I know and I'm doing the program. You know, for me to do something else is really a bug in the program, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm working my program and I'm having fun at it. And you know, when you lead with love, you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have an old adage that I live by and I'm, and I'm pretty in tune with it. It's, um, and you've probably heard it before, it's, and it is, no one cares how much you know until they know how, how much, much you care. care. That's what James Dickey said to me. <laughs> that is very yeah. important, very, very important. He used to say that when, because uh, he and I used to own adventures. Mm -hmm. 
I think I've taken, I've taken a couple of Richard's meetings also, you know, because mm -hmm. Richard's meetings to me are like baptism by fire. <laughs> <laughs> true, 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 true. You know, it's not for the weak. No, no it's not. Or the infirm, or the lame. <laughs> true, <laughs> true, true. Well, no. it's, it's like I said, we have good gatherings, though. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. And to me, I always leave those meetings with something, always. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. In, in and sometimes I go just to, because you don't know who, there's no set schedule of who's going to show up. Mm -hmm. You don't know who's going to show up, but you're probably going to hear something helpful. Yeah. Right, that's true. That's and some real, because we talk, we, we, we talk real with each other. That's true, that's true. Can I tell you what I'm doing with these ministries? What's that? Um, I'm educating them, mm -hmm. is what I'm doing. I'm educating them. You know, I found out since I've been working in racial reconciliation is that hardly anyone outside of academics really knows how slavery began in this country. And that means something. I've also learned that we, we talk about a word, and the word is discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. And we get so angry when we hear that word, especially when you put two words together, racial discrimination. Whenever we say those two words together, everybody loses their mind. Everybody gets angry. Something happens inside. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? We're getting angry about something we don't even have any clue about. We don't know how it started. We don't know the genesis of it. We don't know how the process is, how it got to be what it is. We just get angry. So it's impossible to solve a problem if you don't even know what the definition of the problem is. So one of the things that I do with the ministers in Northeast Texas is we go to school. I teach them history about how slavery started, what was its point, and then we go to Jim Crow, mm -hmm. what Jim Crow was, what the point of it was, and how the effects of it still linger on autopilot and people don't even realize it. It's almost like, you saw the movie The Matrix, right? Mm -hmm. It was the red pill and the blue pill. And I forget which pill <laughs> you take, but if you take this pill, then you open up to the world and everything and the infrastructure that's happened behind it. You can see everything. But if you take this pill, it's, it's, you get to continue being the way you've always been. It's, it's, it's the blue pill that takes you for the ride. Okay, <laughs> so, so, so history is the blue pill that takes everybody for the ride. But in our school systems, we haven't been taught the proper history. Mm -hmm. And so we're all in this matrix or this other matrix of not really understanding. So I just simply took them back to school and asked them, how did it start? I just asked a simple question. How did, racism, how did slavery in the United States start? No one knows the answer to that question. So I begin to tell them. But, not, but I just don't tell them. I provide a whole bibliography of books, so you don't have to take my word for it. You can go read it yourself. Mm -hmm. nice. Then we talk about Jim Crow and what it is. And I'll tell you what Jim Crow was about. Jim Crow was about two things. First of all, slavery was about work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And who does the work? Jim Crow was also about work. And who does the work? The separation into the different restaurants, and you can't do this, and you can't do this, was to so destabilize the mind of African Americans to make them compliant so they will only do menial types of work. So it's a, it was to create an underclass of workers by so destabilizing their mind. So Martin Luther King, he was only halfway successful. His particular movement had two particular points. One was to undo the structure that created the mind destabilization. And the other piece was the, elect, was the economic piece. So just as he launched the economic piece, the Poor People's Campaign, that's when he was gunned down. So it was a two-step process, and he only got the first step done. So since the second step was not done, we're still living in the, the automaticism of slavery and Jim Crow. So now we're the stuck, infrastructure, we're, we're stuck in the infrastructure. Stuck in first year. Mm -hmm. We're stuck in first year. Like, for example, South Africa, right? Well, we got rid of apartheid, but then you still look at the economic uh, degradation, the economic inequality, because no one came and fixed the economic piece of it. What Martin Luther King Jr. was going into, he never got to fix. So what we're living is a thing that's autopilot in what it is. I tell racism is about jobs. So if you go to the major corporations, you go down the county, the city, places over here, if you look to see who's working there, you see very few African Americans there because it is part of the legacy of discrimination and slavery in the country. And then once people understand that, then they know, and now they're informed, and they can make different decisions and hiring decisions 
when it's time for them to make a hire in their companies. So that's what we do. I raised a, lot, a little bit of cane on uh, Facebook. Okay. And uh, one of my theories is that in explaining uh, the political behavior uh -huh. of African Americans is that they seem to think that liberals like them okay. and conservatives are racist. Uh -huh. They hate them. Uh -huh. And I believe that, they're, in my view, they're, they're, and you, you're probably more into politics than me because you got, that's, what, that's your background. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but in my view, it's like, it's almost so they, they sell out all for that affection. They turn their back on God, the, the church, common sense, and just reality. Right. Like, how, like I, I've had this question myself for years. Right. How in the world can you be go to church on Sunday and vote on the second Tuesday in November in support of someone who's, who's pro-abortion? Something, some, there's something that's not, that gets unplugged. Right, right, right. Well, I, I got an answer for that. You know, um, I'm an independent. <laughs> I have to be an independent to be <laughs> in this line of work. And what I've seen is there's, there's, enough, there's enough problems to go around for both parties. You know, there's enough people in both parties do things that I consider wrong or not right. Okay? And so... I think I stay outside of the spectrum so I can call everybody spade when they do wrong. Mm -hmm. But I've learned and I've seen that when someone's on your, same, on your same team, when they do something wrong, you tend to give them a pass. But the exact same problem can happen on the other team when you call it out. And I don't understand that. And I, I look at it, you know, and I'm not trying to get over I look at it as a psychosis. I really do. Because <laughs> it's clearly wrong when this guy does it, but it's not wrong when that other guy does it. And that, to me, doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make for anything um, very healthy. But I'll tell you one thing. About a month ago, I looked up a very important statistic, and it surprised me. And I would think most people wouldn't know this because, again, we don't know our history in this country. We're only taught very much, little. But I went back, and I looked up the Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade. Believe it or not, the decision was seven to two, all right? Five Republican, two Democrat. Five Republican, two Democrat. Also, Republicans have controlled the Supreme Court since like 1968. Since like 1968, it's been under complete Republican control. And they say they're against abortion. But I'm not exactly sure if they are because there have been many periods of time in the Reagan administration, in the George Bush administration, and in the Trump administration where Republicans have controlled all three branches of government and nothing was done about that. So whether I'm pro-abortion or not, I think it's being used as a tool to incite the population so people will vote a certain way. Because if conservatives were really serious about this, when they've had control, they didn't do anything about it. And they were the ones that instituted it in the very first, first place. Five, two, five Republicans, two Democrats. So with that information, I'm, I'm just not sure if Republicans really believe that. Well, this Republican believes it. And I think that what we know now today is that that decision to take life at its most precious, innocent stage is the one thing we should stand for, stand very clearly for. And so I think that, you know, we can't turn back the past, and we do have to understand that when a one party controls or perceived to be controlling each house uh, on the presidency, there's still the number of votes required to overturn things, and so it's not as simple as that. But I do think that uh, as far as the conservative and the Republican position is consistently for life and for the things that I believe are very traditional, and you know, we need to do more. And I think that's why we need to make sure who we vote for represents those values of life. Right, right, right. You know, at the end of the day, that should be what should be a qualifier. It is for me, and for many, 
right. and, and it's probably one of the most important qualifiers. Right, 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 right. I mean, that's a very difficult issue, and um, this is where I fall down on it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I know it, the issue gets confused and confounded with, a, you know, a, a woman's body, mm -hmm. telling a woman what to do with her body. But at the end of the day, um, to abort a baby at the end of the day is not good. Mm -hmm. It's not a good thing, you know. Um, and I understand how it's confounded with telling a woman what to do, but at the end, if we really look at it, it's not a good thing. And one of the ways we can find out uh, or determine if it's a good thing, I, I don't, I don't want to say I know a bunch, but I know a few women who have had abortions in the past. Mm -hmm. And if I talk to them about it now, they're all sad about it. Mm -hmm. They never get over it. So that's how I know that, you know, it's not right because it continues to weigh on them many years after yes. it happens. Yes. And, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I can speak personally to, uh, I was a teen mom. Mm -hmm. I left school pregnant and can, you know, made the decision to keep my son. And God has just taken that and blessed me. It wasn't easy. It hasn't been easy. But he's going to be 44 years old this year. And I have six grandchildren from, that, from his yeah. union with yeah. Peggy. So yeah. as much as, um, you know, the message is that you have this choice at the end of the day, the choice should be for the life yes. and also for whatever is required of you to ensure the safety and the up, upbringing of that life. Right. For you know, for the beliefs that we hold in in our you know love of God and that He created each of us. So right, right. Um, there's a there you know I hope to be the person that can be an example of a person that had that challenge and has shown to work through that and have what I now have. Right. You know. So, and I, I do have friends that have had to make both decisions and. The, as however hard it was for the person that kept the child, you are right. That other choice is, is devastating. It's not good. It's, it's devastating. Not, it's not good. Yeah. It's so, not good. so there's more than just the child, that, the baby that's a victim. Right, right, case. right. But I do want to push back on you mm -hmm. on one thing. Mm -hmm. You, you know, we talked about the three branches of government, and I know, you know, um, you know, when people run for Congress, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or other offices, they get bogged down in talking about whether or not they are for abortion or not. Mm -hmm. But really, as a congresswoman, you can't do anything about it, whether you're for it or against it, because this is a Supreme Court decision, right? But I can support efforts to educate the public to bring, whether it be pressure or education, to more people so that they, they can help put that into perspective and send the message so that the Supreme Court would consider those positions. I think the lo you know this, the louder your voice is in many cases, right, the right. more people will listen. Right, and, right. And um, so I think there is an impact. And as a person, as a leader representing people in, in the district, you also have to, to do what the constituents have a strong opinion on. And, and in this particular district, and quite frankly throughout Texas, it it's for life. Why do you think mm -hmm. the Republican, very Republican controlled Supreme Court for 50 years has not moved on that issue when they've been in control? And you know, I don't, the, I can't sit here after, and, and say that I have read all of the history right? that you have read. Right. I, I can only speak from the position that I know, and you can chime in too on this. <laughs> but, um, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. This is a good no, conversation. No, 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 I, like, I, like this I, I think what I would say to that is that, you know, there is politics. Having been a local mayor, I, I understand how difficult it can be to um, make change. So it, sometimes you have to continue to work at it. Um, and, I, and I just believe that the appointment of judges and the, the number and uh, the environment that's created with what judges are appointed has an impact and that's why the last two judges that have been appointed are very strong and I believe you will see uh, this overturned. If, Gin if Ginsburg goes ahead and kicks the bucket. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> just as long as we continue to She's have a president that will uh, appoint 
those judges, yeah. conservative judges, which I do think we have, and I know he will, and he sh he's already demonstrated that. And you know, he's just completed his first year, so I think when you said Trump hasn't done anything yet about it, just give him a couple more weeks. Right, right. We, what we, do you mean? We have to get over Russianitis yeah. first. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. right, 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 right. <laughs> What do you mean when you, what do you think it means when people say this is settled law? Um, I, I mean, I think it, they just want to say there's no recourse or there's no um, way to overturn something, but there's always a way. People can do it anytime they want to. Like, like Clinton said, <laughs> they had the power and they did it. Right. <laughs> that's that's kind of the way it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Now, what are your main objectives? What would be your priorities in terms of uh, serving the community? Well, I, first of all, I want to keep taxes low. I mean, you know, I'm a small business person. So for 21 years, I've been self-employed. And I like to use the um, analogy of when I started in the staffing industry, I put people, I like to help people get into good jobs. Yes, ma'am. And when I started in the industry, you only had a couple of, like two or three pieces of paper to fill out to get the job. And now I, I lost count. There may be 30 pages of paperwork. So reducing regulation. And, and a big issue that we mm -hmm. must confront is reducing our debt. Mm -hmm. You know, the long-term welfare of our country uh, is at stake. When you talk about security, you have to deal with your debt. And mm -hmm. we don't want to leave that to our children and grandchildren because then they can't do the great things that they may want to do if they're saddled with that. So that would be, those would be a couple of things, you know, just keeping our taxes low, reducing the debt. Um, we've already talked about uh, I'm for life. Um, I think I support the Tenth Amendment. I believe, having been a What's local, the, tenth amendment? the state's rights, which in other oh, words, okay. the people closest to, you know, the California, government. California does too. They have Californians that want us to see from California now. Well, and. <laughs> they, have, they have new California yes. and old California. Well. I believe that the people closest to the government are the best to help make some of the major decisions we face, and the federal government should be limited in its role. It was always intended to be limited. Uh, got a question for you on that? You know, um, <laughs> wait a minute, who's moderating this show? <laughs> you asked me to come on. You asked me to come on. <laughs> you asked me to come on. <laughs> you, you, hey, no, come on. If you don't want me to answer, no, no, that's no, fine. Because no, 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 I'm gonna ask some hard questions. Well, I'll do my best. <laughs> I, I, I told you I checked your background, I knew, and, I, and I figured I figured it work work like this. You figured it work out. No this was your plan all along. <laughs> no, no, not, I, I don't have a plan. I'm, I'm just I'm just a player. I'm just a bit actor. God has a plan. I want to push back on you on that states' rights deal, right? You say mm -hmm. local. You know, sometimes there's going to be a it's got to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. It's good to have a local perspective, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's good to have a national perspective, and you balance the two. For example, you know, the states' rights argument was largely created in the 1870s. 1850s, 60s. Yeah, somewhere from there, mm -hmm. as a pushback against slavery. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and local, you know, if the states' rights argument had prevailed in the 1960s, mm -hmm. Um, I think Jim Crow still would have been going. So sometimes it's not good to have a local, a purely local vision of something. Sometimes it's good to have a national vision of it, because, a national vision of things, because well, it was the national government that stepped well, in. Well, the com and, Commerce Clause took care of that. Right, and, and, and stopped and, and created more equality for people of color, which was a pushback, which was the right thing to do, mm -hmm. but it was a pushback on the Tenth Amendment. Mm -hmm. I, I, so, I, I, so in some circumstances, the states' rights deal has important. to be balanced against a national importance. You should always take except all. That, except that's just one thing. Okay. The one thing that's always bothered, bothered me fundamentally is that the states create the federal government, okay. not the other way around. Right. So I think that the point that's, you that's make good. is about having the perspective of what how, what impacts us when we make individual decisions or state or local decision? What's the impact of that decision? Right. If you hire or elect people of character and quality, they will go down the path of making those decisions in the right way. Yes. If we don't have people that are engaged in the process, 
that's when you find that there's this disconnect between what's happening around us and what's happening within us. And so when I was mayor, I could make I could look at San Marcos yes. and just make decisions there and that right. would not necessarily have been the right thing right. because what I did there could have an impact of Kyle and Buda and right. New Braunfels. That's right. That's right. So there's a balance, but that goes to the type of person we elect, I believe, you know, and how they think and what they demonstrate they would do and how they are in their community. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you know, you, you do have different perspectives and you have to weigh those and the odds of what's going to be the greater good. And so I would hope that while there's an argument that I support because at the state level, or the local level, you have a better feel or sense of what's going on in your immediate community. And that's why I believe that's important. Um, you also need to have people that understand those, the bigger outcomes of their choices. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I don't know if that's exactly the answer you want. It's good enough for me. I think those are important qualities in people that we elect. Yes, ma'am. Susan, relative to your campaign, given the area that your district, mm -hmm. that is covered by your district, isn't it kind of very, very challenging to cover all that, that, that space? Yes, it is challenging. But, uh, you know, and when I was running before, up and down I-35 right. was challenging. And District 35 was right along I-35 on the east side, and this is on the west side. Mm -hmm. uh, this, yes, as I said earlier, there's uh, sometimes it'll be three hours to get to a farther point in the district. But... Um, it's also a beautiful country drive sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you time to think, and you learn a lot uh, well, have, how to operate have, You don't have bumper-to-bumper traffic everywhere you bumper go. You don't have bumper-to-bumper traffic because it could be two hours getting from Austin to New Braunfels sometimes mm -hmm. because of the traffic. So uh, it is a different um, you know, geographical area, but I don't think it's any more challenging than you know, any of the other mm -hmm. districts. They're, they're all connected. We're all connected. So. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did you, so uh, did you have an opinion, position, or thoughts on the DACA, this DACA mess that's going on right mm. now? Well, that's an emotional me a mess, uh, uh, an emotional driven message, and it's, it's a tough one. But, I mean, I do think that people that are here illegally should not be here illegally. And so the president has put forth uh, recently his plan or what he'd like to see in that. And, and he's got a, I think, a very compassionate offer on the table. Uh, but I still think there has to be some specifics if he's going to go forward with um, allowing the people that are here illegally to have a pathway. Because that's, you know, that kind of goes against all those that have stayed in line and waited and done all the things that we asked as a country that they would do. Um, I do think that his plan uh, to have, uh, to end chain migration, to look at the uh, lottery and to put some parameters around those are good long-term plans so that we don't continue to have the problems that we have. Now, now one of the things that concerns me, Susan, is I this. I a question in a minute when you finish. <laughs> and, and that's, and that's I'm concerned about expanding the party. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in that regard, what are your thoughts of what are your thoughts on expanding the party to include more more right now we only get like what 8 to 12% of, of the black vote. Mm -hmm. And I think it should, it should it, we, should, we we should, we need to do better than that. I I agree with you. Um, part of that is having people that are used to reaching out to everyone. And, and I, you know, not only as a person, as a business person, uh, but as the, the mayor of San Marcos, one of the things that I did was do an outreach all the time on my own to everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's asking them to get involved. It's saying, you know, we want you to be part of this process. Now, now, it, now, now one of the problems I have with my conservative brethren is this. They say, oh, they will welcome me. That, that is not enough just to be welcoming no. if you've been demonized for half a century. No. And you said nothing. Right. Somebody said, this guy's bad over here. And you said, sometimes you have to open your mouth and say, no, I'm that's not. You speak for yourself. Right. And we haven't done a damn, too much of a right. damn thing to change that 
thought. Perception. What is that? I, I, uh, I think I, there's straight some. Straight up stupid. Well, and also okay. I think, well, I'm going to speak for myself because I grew up in San Antonio, and you talked a minute ago about the feeling of the being discriminated against. Well, I grew up on the south side of town, and I was in the minority, and um, mostly in, at the time, it was a Mexican-American area. Uh, my dad was military, and I was maybe one of two Anglo-Americans. So it happens to all of us, and I believe it's just because it's an unknown. You know, that mm -hmm. we don't know enough about each other. And you said empathy. You know, to open the doors of communication and invite people in, and and know that you know I might be fearful because I don't know enough. You know, I can remember you know in school feeling like, well, I don't know enough about what they all know about their lives or their culture. So you almost think I'm going to stand back and just kind of watch. So it's fear. It, I think there's a little bit of fear mm -hmm. in just so bringing it's, people it's in. Straight fear. Straight fear. I, I think it's it fear. is. What, what are we fearful about? That we won't be accepted. It's, it's almost like if I walk in that door and I'm in the middle of a group of people that already know each other and are comfortable with each other and their customs and all the things that they embrace and I'm the outsider, if I step in and I'm not accepted, then I get hurt. Right, right, right. And I think we all do that to each other, and, and not even just racially, you know, socially. Right, right, uh, right. So right. I, I believe it. But it does take people of courage to say, well, I'm going to go in there anyway. And that's well, what well, we need to do. So I'm going to step right in one there. One of the things that I that's did is... Right. Fear's driving this. One, yeah. one, 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 one of the things I did is in outreach and engagement with Travis County Republican Party is, and I'm mildly... Well, I'm pretty, I'm fairly optimistic. We may be able to change some things at the state level because of James Dickey. I have taken, when James Dickey was chairman of the Travis County Republican Party, I took James to a couple of Richard meetings <laughs> at, at the Victory Grill. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, at, the, at the Victory Grill, see? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, we went to a, uh, you know KT Ken Thompson? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. His, his group that has a Christmas party. Mm -hmm. Dickie went with me and my wife to the Christmas party. Mm -hmm. He's the on, only on, on, on white boy in there, out there dancing all kind of crazy stuff. So I know he may have the constitution to begin to try to address some of these things that need to be changed or addressed in Texas. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. right. I, I hadn't seen anything happen yet. Right. It, 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 it bothers me greatly that the governor I read, you know, he, he, I hear he's raised 43 million bucks. I don't think it takes that much to win Texas. I have some other thoughts on that. But uh, there's, to my knowledge, been nothing spent to try to expand into the African-American community. And that concerns me because I think, it's, I think it's there to be had because I think that fundamentally our value, many of the conservative values that are embraced by conservatives are embraced by African-Americans. But they're not talking, you know, my thing is you got to have somebody to talk up. So, she just hit on the point. She said, it's fear. Why is he so scared to do it? Well, I said, I don't know why he is. But I'm saying what I have well, experienced. No, no, but I believe you're right. I, <laughs> mean, no, that's, I, mean, that's I mean, I believe you're right. What you said, I believe is right. Yeah. No, and it's, I mean, it's fear. I, it's fear. I mean, I've been doing this work for nine years, and that's what I see. I think, I think what you do, do, Steve, is... From everybody. It's not about photo ops. It's about talking. It's about talking. Talking. Yes. It's about talking. You know, and, and, and how you feel, however you feel, good, you know, however you feel is okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just, it's, it's the, I believe also the fear of being known, the fear of speaking up. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. fear, the fear, like you say, the fear of rejection. The fear of rejection yeah. is driving all of this. Mm -hmm. Fear. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's the fear of, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a preacher. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, it's the fear of God is not going to take care of me, so I have to do it myself. You know, get back to DACA, I'm going to say something about DACA here. You know, we get our Bible from the Hebrews, right? Mm -hmm. We get our Bible from the Hebrews. You know what the word Hebrew means? No, I think you're going to tell us. <laughs> I am, I am. It means river crossing. Mm -hmm. The word Hebrew means river crossing. Okay. So I think that word should inform 
how we look at immigrants. And, you know, I've done a lot of reading, and immigration starts off as a worldwide phenomenon. There are patterns that the world follows in immigration. People move. God created us to move. They've been doing period. It, they've been doing it for over 80,000 years. So if it's a global phenomenon, there's very little that we can do in terms of building a wall, in terms of legislation to stop immigration. But I read a book and it's called Something at the Border. I forget, Something at the Border. And I got it from um the Seminary of Southwest, which is a seminary mm -hmm. over here, Central Austin. And it said that not only is it a global phenomenon, and it, these patterns you can't stop. They're natural phenomenons. Mm -hmm. that we're natural people. We come from the earth. We come. There's no way you can stop it. But it said the immigration from Mexico to North America is a given. Because like Europe, Europe is post-Christian. Okay, Europe is mm -hmm. post-Christian. America is headed to be a post-Christian society. But the immigrants that come up are Christian people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. So he said it was a gift from Pretty God much. that people are immigrating from Central America to North America right. because it keeps us from being post-Christian Christian quite so quickly because they bring a Christian religion to our country. Right. And on top of that... Except Pelosi said it's, it's, it's making America white again. I, I, don't, I don't get into stuff like that, <laughs> but 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 the his, but but the people from Central America are hybrid of European people, African people, and Native Americans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and some African yeah, some exactly. Mm -hmm. And what we have to realize is, the Native American part mm -hmm. of the Central Americans have been here long, long before we long, long long before this. And, this and God created the world. God created, the, this world belongs to God. Right. And we should be able to move as God created us to. And I don't think there's anything to fear. We shouldn't be fear-based that people are immigrating from here. Yeah, I don't, think, I, I don't think it's fear about immigration. It's about the ability to manage that process in the sense of, you know, our own children have needs in our own country. And we should be addressing those as passionately as we are willing to try to find a reason to continue to allow people to come into the country without having to go through a process. It's not about we don't want them to continue to immigrate. We are a country of immigrants, but it is about managing when everybody wants to come here. What you talked about is they were immigrating everywhere and everywhere, and it somehow shook out now it's like everybody's coming here and I know why it's a it's the greatest country you know we have we offer you know we are a compassionate country we still give more than any country to causes far beyond our own borders but in order to continue to do that we have to come up with a process that allows us to take care of our own children as well so I think those are you know there there are many different issues that come along with this and, right. I'm a, and I'm a Christian, right. strong right. Christian, and right. I, I understand what you're saying about, you know, the, the idea of people, you know, moving, and we're made to do that, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm not going to argue that. Right, right, right. But, but I just yeah. feel like at, at the end of the day, when every country decides what their borders are, they also have to come up with the process, and if every other country's rules to get in if you know if the people that want to walk across the river to go to another country can't get in because the rules are being enforced they're all coming here because of that it's not even really about as much choice anymore it's about well they they can only get into our country right but what if the rules are unjust well I'm running for the US Congress so right. my <laughs> job would be to focus on those rules and that process first and I don't think America is unjust. No, I say, what if those, I mean, America has been unjust, though. It's been unjust many times. Well, it's a you country know? that has grown and, I mean, and, and has made many errors. And just like individuals, because it's a country of people, 
we make errors and we hopefully grow from them and do better. And I think that right. our country has done better. Right. I, I think Alabama passed a law several years ago that really impact, impacted immigration. Mm -hmm. And it hurt business so until they changed the law. Okay, it hurt business so until they changed the law. I mean, there are a lot of unintended consequences mm -hmm. that will happen because of this, but I believe the compassionate thing, when people have come here mm -hmm. through no fault of their own and they've contributed to this country for many, many years, it is very non-empathetic and non-compassionate to send them back to a place that they know absolutely nothing about. You're if not. we trust God, we have to believe that God will take care of this country. And we have to remember that Jesus immigrated to a place right. when they were seeking to kill him. If you do the history on what's happening in Central America and Mexico, you will know that many of these people mm -hmm. are immigrating from very dangerous places mm -hmm. where their lives are at stake. And for us not to know that history, okay, and to send people back into harm's way, you know, like my mom would say, I don't think that's very nice. If we truly trust God, we will believe that God will take care of this country no matter what we do. But we have to always be compassionate. But I, and, I, and I would say the two things you said right then was that they were um, contributing and came on not of their own choice. Yeah. And I think okay. in what the president has laid out is to try to address that in what he's suggested recently is to address those two things, which is the compassionate side of this. But beyond that, everything else that came along with that, and if they're not contributing, and if they are adults, and you know, there's a lot of th factors that go into that, and I think those are the, the areas that we are trying to manage. Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to wrap, start okay. beginning to wrap up here. I wanna thank <laughs> both of you for coming on the show. Yeah. I wanna thank Steve for letting let me host this show. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he knew what he was getting into when he brought me on this show. I he did. said it. I did. <laughs> You're a better candidate for it. Yes, it will be. And I want right. to right. right. thank Susan for coming on to the show. I'm very yeah. honored and very grateful that she came. Yeah. And Steve, despite our communication challenges, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to see you. Because I, I, thought, I thought I only needed two mics for this show. But I, 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 so, my sixth sense told me, get three. Yeah, he did. And so I went, I went, I went, yeah, I went, I went my first mind, and it worked out just fine. <laughs> and we're going to have to do it. You, I hope you would consider coming back because I want to get a little bit more into the projects that you're working I on. I want to yeah. because it's March 23rd, 24th, and I need to build some support from it. And for then it. Um, I want people to come out. And I'm going to I'm, I'm suggest to both of you to get you on the trailer park show also. Yeah. To, get, you, to do you, what now? It's a trailer park show that I start, what, that I started out with. I okay. started on a, a trailer park show. Yes, you'd enjoy it. Okay, and, uh, okay. It'll be um, about five or six of us on that one. Yeah. When is that I, one I'm going to be about five, six minutes. I'll, I'll talk to Pokey, see what kind of opening he has. Let's yeah. do it. But I'm doing something every Monday. Okay. But I didn't know you didn't know about the Race Unity Symposium. And I didn't know. You know, I don't live that's here. That's something. I don't well, you live don't, here. Where no. you live? I live in uh, East Texas. I what live town? in East Texas. Henderson. Henderson? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I town? travel with my what project. What county is that in? Rusk. Rusk? Yeah. That's not in District 21. No, it's not in District 21. <laughs> 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 I, know, I know a little bit about Nacogdoches. I'm 15 minutes from there. Oh, yeah? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Susan, thank you for coming thank on the show. Thank you for Wish having me. Wish you luck me. in your campaign. I'm thank sure you. you'll call me to do some, some uh, are there volunteer and paid opportunities to work in your There's campaign? There's many volunteer <laughs> opportunities. Many volunteers. Uh, early Love voting work, starts huh? <laughs> February 20th. There's great reward in helping others. All over the place. All, all over, over the place. place. Huh? And uh, so early voting starts February 20th. 20th. If you're not registered to vote by February 5th, you won't have that chance. So. Well, I got to vote in the primary because I got to go to the convention. Yes, you do. So I can get some pictures from the show. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very, very much. This was lively. What kind of last name is that?